Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, it is good to see our Guatemala missioners, some of them that are back today. I understand they got back after midnight tonight, and I am very impressed that you are in worship this morning. We are glad to have you here. My friends, I invite you now to pray with me the prayer of illumination that is found in your bulletin. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In seminary, I was able to study the different forms of biblical literature, gospel, prophecy, praise, and one called lament. In my young life then, over 30 years ago, I had never experienced truly what lament was. Of course, I knew the definition. Lament is to feel extreme sorrow or regret. I didn't really understand what it meant until I was in my first appointment in Owendal. I had a sermon ready one Sunday morning in late August for Christian Education Sunday. It was my first full-time appointment and I was excited. It was at Ocean Grove United Methodist Church. Owendal, as you remember, was the place along with McClellanville that took the brunt of Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Ocean Grove Church at that time was a little, was a one acre lot on the edge of the Francis Marion National Forest and Ocean Grove's one acre lot was filled with tractor trailer, tractor trailers full of supplies. They had lost homes in Owendal, livelihoods three years before I was appointed there. But on that Sunday morning in August, the low country was waiting to see what some hurricane was going to do off the Georgia coast. Would it turn out to the sea? Or would it crash into Charleston again? That was the background for the week that I prepared for what was going to be on the calendar, Christian Education Sunday, a time where we showed appreciation to our Sunday school teachers, we would promote students from one grade to the other, and I was ready to give pins for perfect attendance. I got to the church that morning a little before Sunday school, and as people came in, could tell there was a sense of anxiety about them. They weren't talking about Christian Education Sunday. They were, they were talking about that storm at sea. And they talked about the dread of living through another Hugo again. As worship began that morning, the sanctuary was nearly full. And this was just a normal Sunday. And as I stood in front of that congregation, the sense of foreboding was palpable. The room was heavy with emotion. The people of Allendahl came to that church that day with a sense of fear and dread and something else. We didn't have Christian Education Sunday at Allendahl in August that year. Instead, we learned what lament was in the gospel of our lives. Rather than a sermon from the pastor, we took time to voice our fears and our dread to God. That's the difference, my friends, between complaining, which is a grumbling about God, and lamenting, which is our cry to God. That kind of cry is an actually an expression of profound faith, 
A faith that tells us we can still voice our hurts and our fears. A faith that God will always be present and that God hears and that God is able and willing to act. The proclamation that morning was the voice of the people in the pews. As they spoke, stood and spoke out of the depths of their fear to Almighty God who hears all supplication, as Eddie read a moment ago. I'll never forget the words to God offered by a shrimper. You know one of those guys down on the coast who own a shrimp boat and they take it to sea every day to earn a living. Their hands are rough from working with ropes and nets. This guy was at the committal service for my first sermon at Ocean Grove. It was a funeral for another shrimper. And there was this man leaning against a tree with a can of Budweiser in his hand as I completed the liturgy. He came to church that morning. And in his blue jeans and faded shirt, he stood in that church that morning in August and lamented and said, Lord, we have been through this once and it was pretty bad. Please don't let us go through that again. No better word, no better lament. This past week, here in Sumter, I have sensed in our community what I sensed in Awendal that morning. Not that we have lived through a pandemic before, except for one lady that I know who's 106. But there is in our community a sense of foreboding and fear. As nursing homes close their doors to visitors, as NCAA March Madness and so many events that we take for granted and take part in the light rites of spring are all canceled. We are anxious about what germs our hands may touch on the surfaces of life. And we cringe when someone sneezes or coughs near us. We think about the vulnerable among us and wonder about their faith and their health. Oh, yes, there have been lots of complaints about the inconveniences and the perceived overreaction to steps that have been taken. We have heard terms like herd immunity, flattening the curve, and social distancing, and I can guarantee you we will never forget those terms. These days are different. These days are anxious and full of lament. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Today, our world is in the depths. Surely, we have been in the deep before, but not this deep. The important thing to remember about Psalm 130 is that the psalmist does not identify the depths from which he cries. In other words, the depths from which you cry today may be the fear of losing your hourly job and the repercussions of the economic fallout. It may be the fear of your own health and your very life. It may be anguish at losing the normality of everyday life. You cry out. I cry out, and it may be nothing that we can name. Sometimes when trouble is at its worst, we cannot name what we feel in our hearts. We can only cry out. 
Where is your dread today? What are the depths from which you cry? Today, I urge you to give voice to them. Don't deny where you are in the depths. I urge you to give voice to them. Don't deny, don't cover up with a false smile. Don't channel where you are into anger at someone else. Give voice to it. Give voice to God. Sometimes when trouble is at its worst, we can, o- we can only cry out. And God knows our sighs that are beyond our words. Because the psalmist reminds us that God hears all of our supplications, we understand that God is not deaf to our lament. God's love is steadfast. It is not conditional. It is not limited to those that are outside of the depths. It is for us as well. After we voice that lament, after we cry out, is perhaps the hardest time It is the waiting. Waiting or some form of that word is used three times in the following verses. Waiting for God. There is not, this is not the waiting we do at the doctor's office or at the checkout line at the grocery store, but it's waiting nonetheless. We're waiting to see if this virus will be as bad as we think it could be. We're hoping that the measures that we are taking will temper it, but we will only find out through waiting. But the waiting that the psalmist talks about is not an empty waiting. It is a waiting that is filled with hope. For you see, lamenting is not just about crying out to God. It is also about the hope in the work and the love of God. While we wait, we hope. Or as we say in South Carolina, according to our motto, while we breathe, we hope. The image of the guard standing watch in the depths of the night is a poignant one. So poignant that the guard, the the psalmist says it twice. The guard is attentive to any movement beyond the wall as he waits for the dawn's early light and the end of his shift as a sentry. We wait like that. We wait with hope, knowing that dawn will come and we will know relief and healing and blessing and life. In Psalm 130, the psalmist moves next in verses 7 and 8 to remind us that hopeful waiting is done not alone, but together. Whereas he speaks of Israel, we speak of the community, we speak of the church, and we find ways to take care of one another. And we wait together in hopes, even as we live in the depths. We encourage one another. We work together and care together as the church. The challenge as we wait is to be the church for the world that is waiting for healing, that is waiting for normality, that is waiting for calm. We are there to wait with them in the ways that we can. As we move forward and live today, we cry honestly from the depths of our hearts to the steadfast love of God. We cry honestly from the depths of our own hearts, the depths that we have as a community and as a country. For we wait in hope. 
for the redemption of God and the transformation of the world. From the depths we cry, we wait and we hope. And we help each other as storms rage off the coast or as viruses race around the globe. We are the church together. And together we wait and we hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.